Okay, uh, hi everyone, it's Smithy Q. I've got a quick video analysis for us. Just the context behind this is on March 19th, the chess schools community, we had a quick little blitz tournament. I think there's about four of us came out, played a whole bunch of games, a lot of fun. And I'll just say as a quick aside that uh, the members are improving very, very quickly, or you guys are massively underrated. Um, I was the favorite by about three, four hundred points, but the games are incredibly hard fought, tooth and nail, some really nice tactics. So we're going to have two videos. Um, the next video coming up, the second video, I'm going to look at um, several games. We'll take a look. We'll do the classic chess schools thing. We get some takeaways, look for the ideas, where we can improve. Both what we did well, but also what we can do better next time. And then for this particular game, or this video, we're going to look at a particular opening. This is because I, the last game that we played was against a fellow member, Jordan. He played an opening that I happen to know quite well, the semi-slav. But he mixed the opening moves up a little bit. There's a couple of move order snafus. It wasn't a great opening, and then it wasn't a great middle game. And all in all, it was a really frustrating game to play. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen. So what we're going to do, first we're going to look at the game to see what went wrong for black. And then we're going to do a deep dive into what makes the semi-slav such a great opening. Because I feel that the semi-slav is one of the most logical, one of the most principled ways to play. And once you know the ideas and the concepts, everything just flows, and the moves feel so good. But if you don't know the ideas, or you mix up the concepts, bad things can happen. So first, let's take a look at the game. So I was white, and we'll see... Uh, we get a classic semi-slav, or more or less in the Moran. Uh, but something went wrong. I already have three pieces developed to his one. That's not very good. And then I have the center. Uh, again, I'm just going through this really quickly. Jordan doesn't want to look through this game very much either. I'm now getting space on the queen side. Uh, we can see that black, he's still very cramped. But now he's even more cramped. He finally plays b6. Great. Oh dear, but... Because the bishop didn't develop, this rook is hanging, so we can't take back with the pawn. Oh, and now the rooks are staring at some really bad pawns. I don't think black has made a single threat yet this game. Uh, he finally developed his piece, but it's still pretty bad. And then, oh, there's a skewer. Pick up a piece. Oh, and now we're going to threaten man on h7. So I'm going to stop here. Um, the game didn't last much longer beyond that. I just want to show you the flavor of this. Because if this were the semi-slav, no one would want to play like this as black. But it's not. So let's do a deep dive. Let's figure out what makes this opening so good. And let's learn to make sure that never happens to us again. Because you should never be in such a terrible passive position. Now to start with, I'm actually going to do something a little bit unorthodox. Just bear with me for a couple seconds here. I know this isn't the semi-slav, this is the uh, the French advanced, but this is the most classic way of looking at a space advantage, or from black, a space disadvantage. As black, what do you do here? Or how about this, what will happen if you don't use your pawns? If we didn't make any of our pawn breaks? Let's say we just develop, okay? White's gonna make a natural move. Okay, we develop our, this piece, okay, I guess that's developed. Uh, Okay, I guess our knight goes here, but now it's blocking our bishop, so we got to move the knight again. Then we move our bishop. Okay, now we've castle. Despite developing all of our pieces, basically all of our pieces suck. Like, literally, like, barely any of them can move to a forward square without just being captured. Most of them can't move at all. Our rooks have no space. We can't do anything. And so if we have a space disadvantage and we only use our pieces, basically bad things happen. White just sailed through here, no problem. Let's go back. Look how things change by just making even one move, one pawn break. Then we develop. Uh, we can develop again. Queen B6. All of a sudden, look at this. Uh, all, imagine the knight is actually going there. We're actually threatening to win a pawn now. <laughs> uh, before, there was not a single threat. But by making this pawn break, uh, we now have pressure here. This rook is going to have an open c-file. If white ever takes, our bishop is a million times more active than it was before. So just giving us 
that pond break gives us so much more potential for activity. Whereas if we don't use them, we're basically, ugh, might as well be dead. There's no point in playing chess if we're going to be so passive. And I emphasize this because pawn breaks, when to do them, uh, which one to do, why uh, to do them, they are central to understanding the semi-slav. It's all about playing with this less space and doing the right pawn break at the right time. So, let's take a look at it proper. Let's start from the very first move so we can understand the concept. White plays d4, and if I were to say what's white's threat, if you don't, we don't do anything, what will white do next? White's going to play e4, and white's going to dominate the center. Right? So if we were to play something, you know, like d6 or something else, white's going to play e4. And I'm not saying this is bad or wrong for black, but I am saying white's going to get that center. And we need to do something about that, either to counterattack, or the most classical thing we can do, we just play d5 and we stop that. If white ever tries that, we're just going to take it. And really, this is the heart of classical chess openings. We're playing against the center. We either stop white from happening, or if white does get it, we're counterattacking immediately. And so, again, if white were to do absolutely nothing, you know, just normal development, you know, everyone's favorite London system, woohoo, whatever, we, things are fine, white doesn't have the center, that's great. You know, we can literally do just about any moves, we'll agree to a draw in 15 moves, that's fine. <laughs> the critical line is c4. Why? What does c4 do? Well, the idea is, if we were to take it, White's going to play e4, and again, he's got the center. White's got everything he wants. He's going to recapture the pawn right away. Now, I'm not, trying, I'm not saying that this is a bad opening from black. I actually play this way as black quite a lot. I think it's great. It doesn't challenge white very much, though. That is, white gets everything he wants. And if you were to ask the average white player who plays the Queen's Gambit, what variation do they not like playing? You know, the Queen's Gambit decline, the Slav, semi-Slav, all those. Almost no one is going to say the Queen's Gambit accepted. In general, it's pretty easy. You know what to do as white. White isn't really being challenged. Similarly, if we're to play Knight F6, this also isn't very great, even though it's surprisingly common in Blitz. Because after take, take, again, white is going to be able to play E4. White gets both pawns in the center. Everything is great. I will say it's a bit more accurate to play knight f3 first, but that's fine. White gets the center. So we want white to not have the center. We want to fight for it. So that means we need to reinforce this pawn. We've got two options, e6 or c6. There's absolutely nothing wrong with e6, except this bishop isn't very happy right now. It's staring at its own pawn. If we play c6, oh, look at that, the bishop still has a wide open diagonal. So when I talk about the Slav, the semi-Slav, being so logical and principled, this is what I mean. Basically, move by move, we can understand the logic behind this. Why do we play c6? It's so that way we reinforce d5, so white can't play e4, and our bishop can still develop. Aha. That's great. Let's look at one of the main lines now. Knight c3, knight, F, uh, knight f6, knight f3, right here. And so at this point, and for the entire rest of our look here at the Slav, the semi-Slav, whatever, we really need to focus on this bishop. It's always that bishop. That bishop guides our thoughts. Because if we can develop the bishop, we are at the very least fine, equal, and more often than not, we're actually starting to do even better. So the question is, in this position, can we play bishop f5? Because that's the move we want to play. We develop, we're going to play e6 next, everything is great. But everything is not great. Because white has played the most accurate move order, he can take here and then play queen b3. You've got pressure here on d5, and there's also pressure here on b7. Normally, um, when white plays these queen b3 ideas, we like to play queen b6 as black. But it doesn't work because d5 is hanging. After exchange, we take, oh, that's the inner move with check, take, take. 
And at the end of the day, white's up a pawn. Sure, he has double pawns, but a pawn's a pawn. Going back. So you can't play queen b6. If you play e6, we lose this pawn. That's not very good. The best move, according to the computer, is actually to undevelop with bishop all the way back to c8. And if you're playing bishop f5 and then back to c8, something has gone wrong. We're not playing an opening to undevelop our pieces. And I'll just point out quickly that if you were to play b6, which might seem the most logical move, just stopping the pawn from being hit, um, after e4, white is completely winning. I'll just give you one variation after take, and then knight f3, uh, we're hitting f7, bishop b5 check is coming, uh, you can't block with knight c6 anymore, nothing can go to c6, uh, there's even ideas of g5 and g4, and simply put, uh, the computer says what, it's plus 3, plus 4, it's as if white is up a piece, and we're only 8 moves in. So that doesn't work. So all this is simply to say that in this particular position, when white has played very accurately, we cannot play bishop f5. We cannot develop a bishop yet. Why? Because if we saw that, white can take and then play queen b3. So in this position, we have to do something different. We basically need to prepare the development of this bishop. And there's ultimately two ways you can do that. We have the classic Slav, where we take, and we have the semi-Slav, which is going to be our main focus when we look at e6. Just to compare the two, if we take, well now there's no queen b3, queen b3 clearly doesn't work, whoops, and we have a threat of playing b5 next, where we're simply going to win a pawn. So white inevitably will play a4 here, we develop our piece, then let's just look at a few moves, e3, e6, let's say take bishop b4. If we look at a position like this, it seems as if everything is happy for us. Look at that. We've got three pieces developed, he has three pieces developed, all of our pieces are on good squares, we're going to castle. Life's pretty good. Life is good. And if you like playing this way, then you can certainly do this. I have found when I try to play positions like this, I don't do very well. And one of the things is that, from my perspective, or what I've noticed in my games, is white still has two pawns in the center, and he's going to eventually get in uh, e4, or he's going to try to. Or he could do something else. Um, I just looked at a sample line. For example, knight h4, he's just hitting our bishop, making it annoying. And then, if we look at something like this, White's made a lot of pawn moves, but he actually dominates the center. We have a lot of pieces, but neither of these pieces can actually do very much. At any point, our bishop's going to get chopped off. Uh, I don't know what to do in these types of positions. I don't, uh, as I feel lost. This is not natural to me. Now, you don't have to play exactly like this, but you have to know how to play like positions like that if you want to play this way. Fortunately for me, there's another option. So once more, the threat is that if we move this bishop, white is going to take and then play queen b3. So the option here is to play e6. Because now, if white were to take, well, we simply take back at the e-pawn. This pawn is super solid. Look at this. we got open lines for all of our pieces. Life is fantastic. You don't even have to look anymore. You don't need any theory to play this type of position. The one thing, though, is you might be thinking, hold on, Smithy. Like, the whole point of playing c6 is to make sure the bishop comes out. And aren't we now locking our bishop in? The answer is yes, we are. But there is a very important difference. Let us go back to this. The queen's gambit declined. What's the most natural move for white? Knight c3, let's develop. He's going to play bishop g5. Let's say we break the pin. e3, castle. And so none of those moves from either side were that hard. You could, If you knew absolutely nothing, you could probably play these sorts of moves. And if you look at white, he has all four minor pieces developed, and they're pretty much on their best squares. It's hard to do much better than this. 
Now, Black has ways to fight back against this, but they're all middle game ideas. It's going to be how the rest of the game progresses. Let's look back now at the semi-slav. c6, knight, 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 e6. What would happen if white tries to play the exact same way with bishop g5? Well, if white wanted to do this way, it actually more or less involves a pawn sacrifice. Because we can take either right now, or we can include h6, g4, and then take. If white tries to take the center, we've got our pawn. Now this is a pretty wild and crazy type position. Black is moving all of his center pawns on both sides. It's not clear where his king is going to be safe. White is easily going to play bishop e2 and castle. His king is perfectly safe. But white's up, uh, black is up a pawn. And so it's that classic case of king safety versus material, activity versus structure. Very interesting, very dynamic positions. Very difficult, in all honesty. And these are the type of positions where the general principles, the ideas, they kind of fade into the background. And what really matters is cold, hard calculation. And so that's absolutely great if you like to calculate, if you're very good at it. Um, I'll admit, I'm only an average calculator, so uh, there's that. But the thing is, is that if white wants to play this, bishop g5, he has to be comfortable letting black enter these types of positions. And a lot of white players aren't. Indeed, one of the main lines, it may even be the main line, I believe, I should have double-checked before I started, is simply playing e3, which is known as the Moran. And the idea is quite simple, of course. If black were to take, white can easily recapture, and the pawn isn't taken. But notice something. This bishop is now stuck behind the pawn chain. So yes, our bishop is stuck, but so is his. So compared to the queen's gambit declined, where white got all of his pieces of good squares right away, well, here he's not going to do that. And so this is one of the power of the the principled nature of the semi-slav, it's forcing white to make a concession. Does he give up a pawn, or does he temporarily trap his bishop? Anyway, from here is where I really want to dive in. So let's look at natural development from both sides. Knight develop, bishop develop, bishop, castle, castle. And now here, white basically has um, a decision to make of whether he wants to try and develop the bishop on b3, sorry, by using b3 and bishop b2, or if he wants to play e4 and develop the bishop this way. And we have different ideas depending on what white does. But again, fundamentally, our idea is we got to get this bishop in the game. Nothing else matters right now. So we can't be thinking about, I mean, know what else you would think about in this position. But your, our guiding thought has to be, get this bishop into the game. So let's look at queen c2 first. It's a natural move, queen, pressuring h7, posture pairing e4. And here's where the, the one idea comes in. We're going to take, and then we're going to play b5. And wherever this bishop goes, we're then going to do, I hope this makes sense, sort of the opposite pawn break. Or that is, depending on how white reacts, we're going to then react in a different way. So let us suppose white puts his bishop um, back, right back where it started. We go here. Then he plays e4. Doesn't it look like white has gotten everything he wanted? He's got the center. All of his pieces are developed. Life is good. But it's our turn. It's Black's turn. E5. We're able to strike back instantly. Imagine something like this. Take, take. Take, take. Life is absolutely fantastic. Um, all of our pieces are good. Well, temporarily, this piece, you might say, is only sort of good. But Black's long-term goal is if White were to do absolutely nothing, you know, let's say, I don't know, White plays, you know, H3... We can play something like a6, let's just say, I don't know, rookie one. We want to get c5 in there. And now look at this. All of our pieces are good. We've got files for our rooks. Our queen has lots of squares I can go. We actually have 
Once the rook comes to e8, quite a bit of pressure here on e4, and even b5 can come, chasing away one of the defenders. Black is very, very active. In fact, black is slow active, and I really want to highlight this. The principled nature, because all of our moves are so logical, let's say white plays f4 here. Kicking our way our bishop. Looks a little bit scary. Oh wait, no it doesn't. We have bishop d4 check. Knight g4. We're threatening. Knight f2 check. He's going to pretty much have to give up the uh, exchange at that point. And if you were to play knight e1, trying to fix that. Knight takes h2. King takes h2. Queen. And that's checkmate. Do you see how our pieces just are able to spring to life once we got our break in? This is because we played natural developing moves, we fought for the center, and we really played a critical pawn break. That is, as soon as white um, got the center, we did what I would consider the proper pawn break. And we know it's the this is the pawn break we want. Because again, let's look at this. Take, 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 take. Look at this bishop. It's staring at its own pawn. This diagonal is wide open. The bishop would much rather be over here, but really hard to get to b3. And instead, it's just staring. And we saw that trying to get f4, so we can play e5 next, makes a lot of sense, but it just completely loses. <laughs> so that's what I'm talking about, where the semi slot <coughs> sorry, is going to teach us the proper pawn break. Because in this position, let's back up again. Queen c2, we take. In this particular position, there's nothing really, well, I shouldn't say that. e5 right away is possible. But look at this. This bishop is, stare, is on a much better diagonal now. If we were to back up, these pawns, they do an excellent job of restricting it. If we play e5, so I'm going to get it on the board, it makes that bishop better. Sure, we can develop our bishop, but this bishop is also very good. We have to be careful, because if we ever try and play rook e8, then knight g5 is coming, and f7 might fall. So this is where we're being a little bit sneaky, if you will, or we're being subtle, we're being cunning, is we take, and then we play b5. If this bishop were to stay on this diagonal, well then we don't want to do this pawn break, e5. We want to do our other pawn break. Let me show you. Bishop b7, just as normal. Let's say again, white plays e4. Again, e5, that feels a bit more dangerous because it's opening up that bishop. But we've got this, c5. Look at this. It might look a little bit crazy because I, I know the first times I was looking at these positions, I'm always thinking, and even today, I've been playing this for about a year now, like heavily studied it. I still think, but what about this? e5, aren't I just losing a piece? A fork? We can take on f3. He recaptures. We then take on d4. And white's got a heck of a choice here. Uh, the knight's attacked. If the knight were to move somewhere, let's say he takes the pawn, he's getting greedy, well, we're able to take here. So actually, uh, we're up a pawn at this point, and white's king, oh, it's it's, he's going to be eviscerated. Look, this bishop is coming in. We can throw this guy. Queen's coming over. Uh, we can even imagine rook up here slides over. Everything's pointed. There's no defenders. Terrible spot for white. Uh, maybe he just takes a piece right now. Uh, take. Well, then we take the knight. He takes back. Rook c8. Again, his king is wide open. Material is equal, but this pawn is horribly weak. We can easily imagine the rook's going to slide up and attack it. Uh, let's imagine a knight moves over here, because now if he tries to block with the rook, nope, knight's in the way. That pawn is almost guaranteed to fall, plus his king is weak, plus his structure is terrible. Black is doing amazing. Because we're able to time, or we use the right pawn break. Do you see how that worked? The bishop is here. We kept that there. We went for c5. Now, we have to be careful. I'm, I don't want to say I'm being a little bit glib. There are move orders and variations in which 
you can't just blindly go, okay, the bishop is here, that means it must be c5. Or the bishop is on d3, that must means it must be e5. Chess is more complicated than that. But as a rule of thumb, it works really well as a guiding principle. Indeed, many of the main lines, black is still trying these ideas, and white is trying to do ways to stop that or to make it more difficult. For example, here, instead of playing e4, um, you'll often play a3 with the idea of playing b4, because then black will never get c5, and then the bishop is stuck over here, and so black is going to have to waste time undeveloping the bishop to bring it over here. That sort of thing. But that is still, it's still our guiding idea. And notice how the entire time we're trying to get a pawn break, and why are we trying to get a pawn break? Is to activate that bishop. And perhaps I went a little bit too fast. Do you notice when we played c5? Look at that. If black try, if white just takes that pawn, oh, all of a sudden our piece is so incredibly active. Because we did the right pawn breaks, because we were focused on the pawn breaks that were getting our bishop active. That is so key. So let's go back. So that was what happens, more or less, after queen c2. And again, our focus is getting that bishop active. And that's by getting one of the pawn breaks. Now, you might be thinking, like, can we do a pawn break right now? Can we just push right through? And the problem is, again, this is where we have to be careful. White can take. Uh, you can capture the knight, sure. Let's just take. Well, this position doesn't work very well. Whoops, we just lost the pawn. So maybe we could do that better. Let's go e5, take, we'll just take with a pawn. Take, 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 take. But now we can see is that we're stuck with an isolated pawn. So sure, we got our pieces uh, developed, right? Sorry, we got our pawn break, our bishop is developed, our bishop's gonna be very active, but we have a very weak structure. And it's gonna be very easy for white to just play b3, bishop b2, say, or just rook d1, knight e2, knight d4, to blockade the pawn. And we want to free our pieces, but we want to do it at the right time. Not so that way we get stuck with the worst structure. That's why uh, taking and then playing b5 is such a subtle way of being able to do the right pawn break at the right time for our bishop. Anyway, instead of queen c2, there's sort of a plan b that white can do. That is, instead of fighting for e4 and getting the bishop um, developed that way, you can play b3 and getting the bishop over here. And black can basically do the exact same thing. Um, that is, the same thing as white. We can play b6, bishop b7, we just, you know, we're just going to throw our rooks in here. And what's going to happen is sooner or later, we're going to play c5. For example, let's say he plays h3, c5. Now, okay, sure, the bishop is still staring at a pawn, but it's also indirectly now controlling this. That is, we're more likely to get our knight to land on e4 because the bishop helps control that square more. And if the pawns all get exchanged in the center, then both of our bishops are staring right down there. That's pretty cool. In fact, let's just maybe look at that. Take, 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 take. You might say that black has um, the hanging pawn structure. In fact, you can say this is called hanging pawns because there's no pawns on either side to protect the pawns. However, these pawns are doing an excellent job of restricting all of white's pieces. And in fact, at this point, we would even say that black has a space advantage. And again, knight e4, knight f6 is coming. And if white isn't careful, you know, these bishops, those knights, things might get dangerous for his king. This makes sense, because again, all of our moves have been so logical, so principled. Uh, it makes sense that good things will happen for us if we just keep playing that way. And then just to show what would happen if white were to switch plans, let's say he plays e4 at this point, take, 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 easily go knight f6, bishop goes back. This is a very common, very popular setup that many people like to do as white. The idea is they're eventually going to get the queen over here, use those bishops, 
Maybe get a rook lift. Badger c5. We can pretty much do the same thing. Look at this. We've got our same thing attacking. If there's an exchange, our rooks can slide over. Or more likely, we'll just trade everything in the center. Black is absolutely fine. Because once again, we did our critical pawn break, which got our bishop into the game. So important. The entire time, we are trying to get that bishop in. Because really, if we were to look back, after e6, knight develops to an obvious square. This knight's already developed. That bishop, beautifully developed. Castle, castle, everything is okay. The only thing wrong in our position is that bishop. And so we just need to solve that. And that needs to be our primary focus throughout. If you can do something about that bishop, you're going to be fine. And if you don't, you're probably going to lose. So let's look at the game. Again, I'm not going to do this in you know, hyper-specific detail. But just can that discussion that we had help? Let's look at this. This is actually a really important thing. Because he takes right now, um, Jordan did in the game, and I got the three pieces developed, and I didn't have to waste the tempo. What would happen in this position if black kept playing normal? In the game, he played bishop e7. Everything I looked at was bishop to d6, trying to get e5 in. But the problem is, because black lost the tempo, white could play e4 now, and there is no e5. Uh, whoops! <laughs> uh, white controls it more. So time is so important. So wasting this tempo right here, for example, if bishop to d3 happened first, and then we took, take, knight d7, knight f3, bishop to d6, then we would have e5, and we'd be okay. But uh, in uh, the way it happened, whoops, let's go back, it didn't, so he had to put his bishop on a worse square. This means it's going to be really hard to play e5. Crap, okay, now we'll never play e5. So here we go. We're in this position. What should, what do we do? So we know what we want to do. We need to get this bishop. So what do we, where's that bishop going to go? Clearly, it can't go on this diagonal anymore. There's too much stuff in the way. We can't get an e5. So it's going to be some combination of c5, b6, and bishop b7. That's the plan. And once you know that, in this position, c5 makes a heck of a lot of sense. You've got two pieces controlling it. White only has two pieces defending it. b6, bishop b7 is coming. Life's golden. We played h6 instead. Okay. Then I played a4. So we can't play b5, but we could play c5 and b6 still. That'd be very good. By playing knight b6, do we now see the real problem with this? And this is really, I, I think if you look at the computer, uh, the move where the eval just shoots way up in white's favor. Why? Sure, the knight's attacking my bishop. The bishop's going to move. Sorry, white's bishop. Like, it was my bishop in the game. But on here, the knight isn't helping the c5 break. If we play c5, he can take it. The knight defends it. Whoops, we're just down a pawn. Here, the knight isn't helping this bishop. In fact, both h6 and knight b6, neither of them are dealing with how to get this bishop into the game. And that was where Jordan went wrong. Sure, the rest of the opening could have been a little bit better, sure. But if he were to focus and get c5 in, it would be a game. But he wasn't able to do that. Okay, sure, queen, he gets pushed all the way back. He finally... He, Finally gets half of it in, b6, right? But he's got a terrible structure. And he, to the end, these pawns completely clamp him down. He can't get c5, he can't get e5. The computer says he's losing. And I think we can clearly see that, okay, also he's down exchange. So that's not very good. But his pieces never did anything because he never got the right pawn breaks in. And so his bishop was always terrible. If you're going to play these types of structures, because this is the risk. Literally every pawn, uh, our center pawns, are on the same color square. And so we have to, have to, have to do something about that bishop. 
That's goal number one. And if you can do that, uh, there's nothing wrong with our positions anymore. So I hope that was, uh, I don't know if that entertaining is the right word, educational. Uh, you got something out of that. Uh, I was kind of ad-libbing. Hopefully I didn't make any move order slips or whoops. But the idea, the concept is really, really important. If you get that bishop, you know, happy bishop, happy life. That's all I'll say. So great. Uh, questions, comments? Let me know. Make sure you do the like and subscribe thing. If you liked and or want to subscribe, that'd be great. Otherwise, it's a speaking to you guys. Uh, bye for now.